Hi, everybody. Welcome. Now we're going to, for some housekeeping to take care of, uh, there was a question that uh, Joe had as far as is that Northern Empress Elm available? It's going to be widely available in 2019. And some special qualities of it besides that burgundy fall color is that it's nearly a seedless tree so there's no litter problems that's great so look for that in your garden center in 2019 okay the other thing to talk about is that uh, handouts for tonight uh, Greg Morganson gave me permission to modify his handout so you can see all those beautiful slides and all that text that goes with it and so you can look for that. I'll have that posted on the Spring Fever website tomorrow. And also I'll alert uh, agents out in the counties to the availability of that handout. So it gives you a much uh, ex more expansive look at, at Greg's presentation, which we appreciate tonight along with Joe's. Now we're gonna talk about tough sites. Tough sites, my goodness, I would say, uh, Tough sites, the whole state of North Dakota can qualify for this, especially tonight. Here we are in April, <laughs> coming here in Fargo, cars and ditches, blizzard in April. My Lord, what a tough place to live. But we're going to take that even a step farther, and we're going to talk about some trees that can take the harshest of conditions in North Dakota. Uh, dry places, salty places, shady places, windy places, poorly drained places. The worst of the worst, the harshest places. And so here we're going to talk with the head of the Woody Plant Introductions for North Dakota State University, Todd West. So please welcome Todd to the forums. All right. Thank you, Tom. Um, with this presentation, though, the caveat is that all these plants are going to be hardy across North Dakota. Also, they're going to be alkaline tolerant. So we're dealing with the pH. So I'm not going to talk about pH tolerance because that's an issue that all of us have to uh, deal with. So tough sites. Here's a tough site, not what we're worried about. Another tough site, you know, these are some pretty tough sites. What we're looking at is more of these type, type of tough sites where we have very limited root space. You know, our yards are not going to be quite as limited as this. Same thing here with these tree pits. You can see the dieback. There is issues to deal with because of the architecture, not necessarily the site itself. You know, this is more of what we want, these boulevards and into our yards, but then we're gonna have some issues with them depending on where we are in North Dakota. The neat thing about trees, they can adapt. You know, here's a tree that came out of the pit and it's following along the cracks of the bricks. Kind of fascinating. It's amazing what trees can do. So the first area I want to talk about is shade tolerant. Remember, we're dealing with all pH tolerant. We're dealing with all hardy. Uh, here is a tree that is very underutilized, uh, pagoda dogwood. It's one of the few uh, medium, small to medium sized tree that can handle a good heavy amount of shade. Uh, zone 3, U.S. native, uh, has really nice scaffolding branches. The picture lower right uh, is not very large, but it does show its size. It does show the white flowers that it will get. It does develop a nice purple fall color. It has blue fruits. One of the few trees you can really put on that north side of the house, get some height out of it, and it's really, really nice. Uh, wind resistant. Now, I'm not going to show all of these. Uh, we're just going to hit some highlights, but European larch is one that does well in wind. It's used pretty extensively in wind breaks. Hackberry. Uh, more so into our interior type plantings. You know, here's hackberry, also a native, really nice structured tree. Uh, again, very cold hardy, tolerant of a lot of different conditions, very urban tolerant as well. Uh, you see a lot of these in our urban centers, Bismarck, uh, Fargo, Grand Forks, et cetera. Uh, about 40, 70 foot, so bigger tree. So we don't have a lot of trees that will get to a really big size, but hackberry is one that does really well. I do want to talk about a few cultivars as we go along that are some, kind of some unique opportunities here. Prairie Sentinel hackberry out of J. Frank Schmidt out of Oregon uh, made this selection. It's a really nice fastidiate upright tree, only gets about 12 foot wide, which is very atypical of hackberry. So now we can put in a tree into some really tight spots. Can handle drought, it can handle the wind, you know, and a lot of these trees that we're talking about do have a lot of crossover. They're not just wind tolerant. You know, hackberry is drought tolerant as well. And it's very adaptable to different soil types. So they, they do cross uh, boundaries. 
Uh, drought tolerant, you know, we're dealing a lot with uh, drought lately. Uh, so here's a pretty, not in a huge extensive list, but hackberry again. Uh, we have northern honey lo or thornless honey locust, Kentucky coffee tree, flowering crab, amber cork tree, bur oak, Japanese tree lilac, American linden, eastern red cedar. You know, a lot of these you probably have seen on boulevards because boulevards are quite dry and they're often then approved for these lists. So I, I just want to hit a couple of them. Thornless honey locust, uh, NDSU has by far the hardiest selection into a zone three. If you see on my bullets there, I've got zone three in parentheses, and that's because uh, it could be a little iffy uh, overall, but with the proper genetics, we're fine. And Northern Acclaim does great in a zone three, also a native as well. Get that nice dappled shade, it's turf friendly too. Kentucky coffee tree, this is one that is a really ugly tree when it's first planted but it develops into a really, really nice high quality tree over time. Uh, it's also US native too. It virtually is completely pest free and also tolerant of urban conditions as well as drought. Uh, so really, really nice selection. Uh, here is a cultivar espresso. Uh, it also is seedless. It's a male selection. Uh, and so we don't have to worry about those big chunky pods that they'll have, but they're heat tolerant, drought tolerant and cold tolerant. This one, zone four. So we're uh, trying it out in the zone three to see how it will do. This is one of my favorites is Amber Cork Tree. Uh, it too is a solid zone four, potentially zone three with some testing. We're testing this across the state. Uh, it is a non-native, uh, 40 by 35 foot. It also is pest free too. Uh, so these are the things we want to look at. Not only plants that do well in these harsh conditions, but also have that compounded uh, benefit such as being pest-free. So a really nice one for drought tolerance as well. Uh, a couple cultivars, His, Ma His Majesty, that's one that's been around for quite a while. Uh, that's a nice selection. There's also a newer one out of the University of Wisconsin called Eye Stopper. Uh, it too is a really high quality cork tree. Uh, bur oak, I think we can all agree that bur oak is extremely adaptable, used throughout the state. It's the only oak that's native in North Dakota. Uh, it is in the white oak group. Uh, just again to talk about a few cultivars to add some variety now to the Baroque because most of them have been come, uh, grown as seedlings. We have urban pinnacle oak, so a much narrower upright form, only 25 foot wide. And then this newer one, cobblestone, it's been selected for having the uh, accentuated corky bark. Uh, and so it just adds that extra feature. It's still pretty standard size, 55 by 45. But does extremely well all these on the boulevards. Urban Pinnacle, much better choice for boulevards. This is one out of Canada, out of Bylands Nursery called Top Gun. Uh, it too is also a much narrower selection. So 55 by about 15, maybe 20, but super cold hardy. Again, much better choice for boulevards than seedling. Uh, Japanese tree lilac, you've seen these popping up all over in yards and on boulevards. Uh, hardy zone three, not native. Uh, 25 by 20, this is one we'll talk about a little bit later, is utility friendly. You can see in this picture, utilities running above it. Also uh, pest free, uh, and there is a cultivar snow dance that is completely sterile. So it will flower quite, quite prolifically and at a young age, but it doesn't produce any of those seed pods. Uh, wet soils, again, not a completely, you know, complete list, but just a couple selections. We have box elder. Ohio Buckeye, and then Niobe, or, or the Golden Weeping Willow, are some good choices. Uh, Acer Nagundo, the Sensation Box Elder. Box Elder typically does not get a nice fall color. I'm always looking for trees that have uh, more than one benefit. And here now we have a U.S. native that decent size, 35 by 25, but it gets a red fall color, which is not typical for Box Elder. Uh, not only is it tolerant of dry soil, but it also can do uh, wet soil too. So it, it, it's a full gambit. So here we're talking about wet spots, but this could also have gone into our dry soils as well. Uh, it's a male clone, so you don't get all of the fruit produced and all the little seedlings. So great choice, sensation, seedless, and fall color. Uh, saline soils, so now we're not talking about necessarily pH, we're talking about salt. And so bur oak, thornless honey locust again, black walnut, Eastern Red Cedar, and American Elm. We've heard uh, quite a bit about elms tonight, so we'll hit a, a little bit on elm. 
Um, we already talked about the others, so I, I want to bring up juniper here. The, this is the eastern red cedar, but it's also called a juniper. And this specific cultivar is Taylor, Taylor juniper. Uh, hardy zone four, possibly zone three. Uh, we're looking at that in a more northern uh, planting as well. Uh, 30 foot by three foot. And completely deer resistant. Uh, which again we'll talk about a little bit later here too. Drought resistant, dry soil tolerant uh, as well. So just a really nice selection. It can handle that salt. It can handle it dry. Picture on the right is just showing several of them grouped together. Uh, center picture there uh, showing it uh, basically standing as sentinels uh, on either side of this uh, high-end home. And they'll get as tall as that root line and just fill in quite nicely, requiring no pruning whatsoever. Uh, American Elm Prairie Expedition, this is an NDSU release. It's one that is uh, DED uh, resistant. I like to say DED tolerant because all elms can get Dutch elm, but it has the ability to fight it off. So it won't uh, kill the tree, but it will maintain a good quality tree. Uh, it is by far the hardiest of all the American elm cultivars. This is the one that should be used. It is still going to be a big tree. It has the traditional cathedral style of form to it, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, and as all elms are, very fast growing. You do have to maintain a, a good amount of pruning schedule with any of the elms. Uh, compacted sites. Uh, so here's a list. We've got Prairie Horizon, Manchurian Alder. That's also an NDSU uh, release. River Birch, Silver Maple, Hackberry again, American Larch. So we have a different species from the European. Uh, this is our native species. Uh, can do very well in compacted sites. Flowering crab apple, and then arborvitae. So here we have another evergreen that we can use. So here is the uh, Manchurian alder. This is approved on a lot of the boulevard lists throughout North Dakota. Hardy zone three. It's non-native, um, but it can withstand just about any condition you throw at it. Wet, dry, compacted. You know, it just does really, really well. Uh, it is in the birch family, and so it does have these uh, cone-like structures that do persist into winter, which gives it another ornamental value to it. Fall color is not very exciting. It's kind of a green, uh, yellow, but these cones do persist and, and add some character to it. But really, really diehard tree. Uh, a newer one that is just hitting the market now finally is Northern Tribute River Birch. River Birch is not considered to be hardy. Uh, but this one is. This is a selection that Dr. Herman, uh, Dale Herman, selected. Uh, zone 4 definitely, we're testing it in a Zone 3 as well. It's a U.S. native, and typical of river birch would be chlorosis in compacted soils and our high alkaline soils as well. But this one is pH tolerant, so we don't see the chlorosis. We get a nice, lustrous, dark green leaf during the growing season nice yellow fall color, but then we get that exfoliating bark as the added winter feature. Uh, it can be planted as a single uh, stem or a clump. We don't want to have suckers because then we get that included bark and poor structure, but what is typically done with the clump forms is that the nursery will put in three different uh, plants into a single pot to make this clump, and that's what, if you want clump form, make sure you, you go for that. Uh, utility friendly, so we want to have a maximum height of 25 foot. Uh, fortunately, a lot of communities are burying their utilities now, so it's not as much of an issue, but it still is an issue in many places. So again, there's a much more extensive list, but uh, in lieu of time, I just wanted to hit a couple of them tonight. So here we have flowering crab, Japanese tree lilac again, uh, and then prairie gem flowering pear, which I believe that uh, Greg talked quite a bit about these small trees, so I, I did not want to go into detail. I just wanted to hit a couple highlights. Not, not sure if Greg talked about this one, but this is one of my favorites is Mary Lee flowering crab. There's a big uh, trend now for these upright columnar type form of crab apples. You know, these are not your grandparents' crab apples anymore. They're quite wide and they're fitting into some really nice tight spots on boulevards. Again, much better choice because less pruning is required. Um, but they just fit into these spaces quite nicely. Um, this is zone four. We're testing it in a zone three as well right now. That's again why I have those parentheses there. About 24 by 10 foot uh, has that narrow upright habit to it. 
the buds come out, they'll be budded pink, but then open up as a double white. Uh, and it's also fruitless. And it's, it has really good disease resistance to scab, to fire blight. Um, and, and so just a really nice selection. And actually, this is uh, not an NDSU release, but it's an NDSU alumni release. Uh, so pretty excited about that. But this is readily available in the trade now and doing very well for us. Uh, Prairie gem flowering pear, again, this was already mentioned, but Pyrus usuriensis. So this is one of the species that's hardy here, also pH tolerant, has a really fast growth rate. The lower right picture there, you can see its form. This has not been pruned. It's, it's about the most perfectly shaped small tree that you can possibly get. What's nice about it is the white flowers do emerge before the foliage, uh, so you get a, quite a nice show. Um, also, it's very tolerant of urban pollution as well, so it often shows up on our boulevard list. So uh, more information about our program can be found at these websites. Uh, you know, this presentation obviously will be online, not found at these websites. Um, but if you want to know more information about our releases that have been selected and are very do very well for North Dakota, please visit these uh, websites and then my contact information if you ever need any information. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Todd. And you just uh, mentioned about how this presentation will be available in the future online. And we have Bob Birch to thank for that, our web technology specialist who does everything here at the Spring Fever. He is the, the nuts and bolts of the operation, makes it run so smoothly. Just so appreciate Bob's efforts, and we've been getting those YouTube videos up in a day or two, so um, you can tell your friends tomorrow about all the great talks that you saw tonight. Please share with your friends so you can watch a repeat version of it, <clears throat> or an encore performance. <clears throat> Todd, i got a few questions yeah. for you. How about uh, this person likes that Almore cork tree you talked about? Oh, yeah. Is that common for a nursery to carry? It, it's uh, probably a little bit more on the rare side, but they are definitely available. So if you ask any garden center or nursery to, to get one in for you, they definitely can. So let's go over that because this is a common question. So if you like one of these kind of unusual trees, you can go to your local nursery and specifically ask them to order a tree, this, you know, like this it, cultivar for you, and they will they will order it for you and then... How's that procedure work? Exactly. And because, you know, nurseries are a business. So right. they're in the business to sell trees and they're going to sell trees that everybody wants. And so if you want one of these more rare trees that people don't know about, you just simply go in. And some nurseries are a little bit more adventuresome uh, than others. And so um, you have to go in, you may find it, but if you don't, you just talk with one of their nursery workers there. And they should be able to get one on the shipment pretty quick because they all the nurseries here in North Dakota will get several shipments during the growing season. So it's not like, you know, you go in spring and that's all they have. That's right. OK, how about. Um, they, they have an here's a, a general question. They have an American linden that's eight years old. The rabbits got to it and now it looks like a bush. <laughs> What would you do if that was your tree? Would you just keep pruning it, trying to keep a single leader, or would you just start all over? With with it being a linden, with it being that small, I would start over. Okay. Because you're 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 just maintaining you know yeah. bad structure, and it's going to be a fight. In Not a long it. run. You're just a long run. Off. You're just start better off over. getting yeah starting over, and make sure you live trap or do other things to get rid of your rabbits. How about, uh, how, how do you prune a pagoda dogwood? Good question. Um, really, with the pagoda dogwood, you don't have to do a lot of pruning. Uh, the nice thing with pagoda is they don't sucker uh, extensively like most of the dogwoods do. You can have minimal suckering, but that's, that's something you want to you know kind of pay attention to. But for the most part, it, it really develops a good structure on its own. You may have to thin it just a little bit or do, and do some minor structural pruning, you know, branches that are crossing over each other. But very little pruning is really required with the pagoda. And you have that natural horizontal. Yeah, they, they just, that layered pagoda look. Okay, our linden lover with a hungry rabbit has a follow-up. <laughs> he, he, he says the base of that linden tree is really thick. Are you sure he should still start over? 
<laughs> you want to send Todd a photo, maybe? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You could send me a photo. Um, I mean, you can select a single leader and let it let it go again. Um, it just kind of comes down to your choice. When a, when a leader comes out like that and you prune it to a single leader, will that will will that be develop into something as strong as a plant that was never cut back? It just original it, leader? it really kind of depends on the angle that the branch is coming off because in a sense it's really not much different than the way trees are produced clonally anyway because they're often budded and you'll have that kind of a crooky kind of angle coming up out of the tree so it's not very different from what's being done in production anyway so it's definitely doable okay so there's hope for that Linda. it sounds <laughs> like you really love it so there's hope there you how about that uh, sensation, that box elder? Yes. Does it keep its leaves long enough to color, or do they drop like the other box elder? Well, the only experience seen. I've seen with sensation is in Bismarck and in Fargo, you know, and that being, you know, the banana belt that we are in North Dakota, that it does color uh, pretty decently. And, and it's more of a cold selection, so it colors better in the colder climate than it does in warmer climates. So... Um, it seems to do fairly well. It's just we don't have a lot of them here in North Dakota to get a good sense yet. And it does not have any seed pods, so it would not attract the box elder bugs yeah. as much. As much. That's important. Still wouldn't put it necessarily right next to my house. Okay. Uh, how pH tolerant is that Northern Tribute River birch? That is extremely pH tolerant. It's it's kind of scary how pH tolerant it is because river birch is not known to be able to grow in compacted sites really well with that uh, pH uh, aspect and, and it's performed very well for us. Uh, it was selected in soil uh, that was above eight and it's been growing and tested in above eight. The cultivar is Dickinson, so this is actually a selection that was made from a parent tree in Dickinson, North Dakota. Okay, how about that prairie gem flowering pear? Is that a fruitless pear? No, so uh, with that species, uh, it's just like the calorie pears as well and your edible pears that if you have another pair nearby of a different clone or a different species, it will produce some fruit. They're generally quite small, um, but generally, we say generally, uh, it's going to be fairly fruit-free. Um, here's one question that nobody's answering tonight. <laughs> All right. There you go. We've got an angry customer out there for some. you demand an answer. How about... Uh, Got drought hardy, tough trees, but really, how long do they live? And you know, do you have some that are like, like I know Greg talked about the choke cherry. It wasn't one of his favorites. It's a relatively short-lived tree. Mm -hmm. But do you have some that are like especially long-lived, or maybe yeah. some of the extremes? Sure. No, there definitely is a quite a wide variety when it comes to life expectancy of a tree. Um, and actually, Tom and I were talking about this, about how a lot of people want fast-growing landscapes. They want that instant landscape. Uh, whenever you look at a tree that generally grows fast, it means that it has poor wood structure, so it falls apart easy, as well as short-lived. Um, and But some uh, trees, you're quite lucky where they will be grow quite fast, but then they'll slow down and they have decent wood, like elms. All the elms are known for extremely fast growth rate when they're young, but they're actually a long-lived tree. They do slow down, they get really good structure to their wood, you know, compared to, say, a silver maple. Silver maple that grows extremely fast, you know, there are those trees where you'll plant it and take it down in your lifetime. You know, silver maple, you get good 40, 50 years out of it, you're doing well. Box elder, same way. But the hopes is then you're either dead when you have to go to remove it, so you don't worry about it then, or move. Right, and the other person can deal with it. <laughs> there you go. And they'll never be the wiser. But, but there is quite a bit of variety, you know. And, and generally, with a lot of the smaller trees, they tend to be a little bit shorter lived. Um, you know, the Baroques, long lived, slower growing. 
Yes, there's a, a lot of variety. You know, also, you know, you're recommending quality trees that are relatively pest free, uh, you know, relatively disease free. So that's going to help their their life. Exactly. Okay, how about uh, an aus tree, a U.S. tree, those Australian poplar, super poplars? Mm -hmm. You got a comment about them? Um, every plant, right plant, right place. Uh, poplars have the, their spot. Uh, again, not next to my house or where I park my car. Um, but if you do need, you know, something that will grow quick and establish to give you a little bit of a windbreak or, or some shade, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. But realizing that in the future, in the very quick future, you're going to be dealing with limb breakage. If there's a bad storm that comes through, you know, weak wooded, uh, short lived. And again, that's one of those trees that, you know, myself, I'm 45. If I plant one, I'll be taking it down when I'm retired. Okay. Well, you know, talking about a fast growing tree, this person, it's an uh, unusual question as far as uh, they want to replenish their fireplace wood supply. Mm. So we got a good tree for that. Growing well, for actually, there's there's a place. lot of great information online. I'm not going to tell you what the best are because I don't know that off the top of my head. Right. But there's a lot of great information online for uh, the BTUs that wood actually mm -hmm. does put out, uh, and so you can definitely find that uh, online very readily. Um. Uh, this person has a comment about the aus tree. It attracts a lot of aphid issues, and that was that was the. Then they got out the chainsaw. Sounds like. Yeah. There you go. I say if aphids is your only issue, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this garnered just uh, an ounce of prevention or a <laughs> cure. So saw the mistake early. I cut your losses. Maybe that's, that's the, a, uh, before it gets too bad. An ounce or a, a quart of uh, <laughs> chainsaw fuel. There you go. Okay, this is going to be a hard one uh, to ask. Um, okay, there's two trees that are growing out of an overgrown lilac patch. When that these two trees grew, they ended up becoming arched, arched, arched or slanted. Okay. Um, the lilacs are gone now, and the person's trying to strap the two trees together that are slanted to make them more upright. And they keep tightening the strap every six months a couple inches. Is it realistic to think that these trees are ever going to grow upright? That's, that's a very difficult thing. I mean, you can keep trying, but think about uh, the habits that we've formed over the years, how difficult it is for us to break habits. And you are trying to break a habit that has been created, but now you're also fighting compression wood, which has that strength that, that the tree has actually put on that had to compensate for that angle. And you're fighting compression wood, which is very, very difficult fight. Yeah, you know, this also, this could be a good one, Judy, that yeah, so if you take a photo of it, that could be helpful. And also if we knew the type of tree it was, that, yes. might, that might make a big difference too. Okay, any last questions out there for Todd? I'm just going to give uh, Todd's email. Perfect. So that can help with your photo questions. <clears throat> okay, I don't see any of the questions, so I'm going to say thank you, Todd. That was great. And we're all on time. That's even better. So thank you, Todd, for that really interesting talk it was wonderful okay we're just going to wrap it up here i want everybody to get home tonight with the with the terrible weather and all especially in the southern half of the state um just talk a little bit about next week next week we're going to wrap it up hopefully it won't snow next monday that would be amazing if we could just have one monday where it didn't snow uh we have a series of special topics that we're going to talk about we're going to talk about first of all about some of the bugs that exotic bugs that are invading North Dakota or right on the border ready to enter so we got to find out how to identify these bugs and how to combat the bugs or slow their spread uh, we're going to talk about disease management too and that I don't know if a lot of gardeners know that is that NDSU has a plant health clinic available to you that can help you identify and manage diseases so we'll learn about what the features that they offer to gardeners and lastly, we'll wrap it up by a, a research summary about some of the major uh, high value crops 
that we're doing research on, including grapes and hops and June berries, potatoes and blackberries. So we got all that next week at the Spring Fever Garden Forums. Uh, tell your friends about it, and uh, everybody, have a good night. Thank you, everybody. It's great.